Good morning, everybody. Um, for those of you I haven't met yet, and I don't think there's too many in the room that I, that I don't know, I'm Patty Strand, and I'm just very happy to welcome you to what I think is the 22nd National Conference of the National Animal Interest Alliance. <laughs> I have uh, started off, I have a few people that I want to thank and, and welcome specially. And first of all, I wanted to just bring your attention to what's on the screen, our sponsors. We couldn't do this without the help of our friends and supporters. And so I have put the names of some of the groups that have been very, very strong supporters over the years. And I want you to thank them all um, for us because, again, we wouldn't be here without them. I also want to uh, take this moment to introduce some of the board members of NAI. I think that there's more here this year than, than we usually have. Could you guys just stand up, those of you who are on either the NAIA or the NAIA Trust Board? We actually have two groups. So, um, <laughs> Thank you. It's, a, it's a wonderful group of people, and one of the very unique things about NAIA is every single person who's with us is a volunteer. Nobody, receive, nobody in this group receives any kind of compensation. They pay their way to the conferences. Uh, they support us in every way they can. They're available on the weekends and at night uh, to help when things, uh, when help is needed. And so they're just, it's just an absolutely fabulous board of directors. I'm especially happy today to have Al Grossman with us. Dr. Grossman was on our original board of directors and he also is the publisher of the book that my husband and I uh, Rod, where are you? Um, there, he, there he is. A pretty special person, too, my husband. My husband is uh, <laughs> totally dedicated to, to what we're doing here. But anyway, back to Al Grossman. Uh, he published our first book, which was The Hijacking of the Humane Movement, Animal Extremism. That was back in 1992. It was the first book in the United States on the subject of animal rights extremism. And as you might have guessed, we definitely received um, some pushback from that. I think he got lots of threats in his, uh, at his place of business, and, and so did we, of course. But anyway, it was a pretty brave act, especially back in 1992. So thank you, Al. We're happy to have you with us. I also wanted to acknowledge Nancy Fisk. Is she here? She's, she's working away. Well, Nancy Fisk has been working away. Uh, these wonderful little centerpieces, this is the result of a contribution from Feld Entertainment of the wonderful little plush elephants that are in the middle. And then Patty Cleekin and Nancy decided they'd make a little um, circus ring for them to sit in, and then you'll notice that at the top of the elephant's trunk there's a little note that says, the conversation begins with you. And that is the name of our, our conference today, is the conversation begins with you. And it's a very relevant conference title because the issues that we all face have to do with being in what is, it could be characterized as about a 30-year propaganda war in which many people who live and work with animals have been maligned as um, doing things that they should not do. And the goal of the conference today is to present new information and tools for you so that we can take back the conversation. Because the fact is, whether we want to admit it to ourselves or not, the bad guys really own the conversation. It isn't really that they dominate the conversation, they absolutely own it. Um, if, you, if you think about what you do in dogs, no matter how many wonderful things you do, they don't wind up in the media. If there's anybody in your community that ever does anything wrong or can be perceived to be doing anything wrong, they're definitely front and center, center in the media. So hopefully the presentations that we have today will uh, actually provide some tools people can take back and work with later. And I'm just really thrilled that you're here and uh, hope that you have a wonderful time with us. Um, we're all friends if you have any questions or or you want to give us any input, please just feel free. This is, this is like, you should feel like you're sitting around your, your dinner table, okay? That's what I'd like for the weekend. 
And um, next, I'd like to, since Nancy wasn't in the room, I'd like to introduce who the person who's going to be your moderator, who is our president, Dr. Marty Greer. Dr. Marty Greer is not only a veterinarian and a, someone who is highly regarded as a reproductive uh, person all over the country and purebred dogs, but she also, because she had so much time on her hand, went back to school a couple years ago and became a lawyer in her spare time, too. And she's written books, and she's been a lead investigator, or investigator in a number of scientific studies. And we are just very, very proud of our Marty, and she is now going to take this thing over. Thank you. Well, due to circumstances beyond the control of Patty, we've had a slight change in the schedule. <clears throat> One of our speakers was hung up uh, flying yesterday. So we've had to change the order of the program. Now that, don't worry, everybody's still here. We've just shuffled things around a little bit. So everyone you came to hear is still going to be speaking today just in a somewhat different sequence. So instead of starting off with one speaker this morning, we're going to start off with our uh, panel discussion and then we're going to move through the rest of the day. So um, I'm really very happy that this program has pulled together the way it has. Patty and her um, people have done a super job of getting together just a tremendous uh, group of people for this weekend. So I'm excited that you're all here. I hope you are too and uh, that you all enjoy yourselves. So the three people on our panel besides Patty are going to be Phil, um, and I always pronounce this wrong, Gidry. So the U isn't really there. No. All right. He is the AKC Government Relations Senior Policy Analyst he provides direct oversight of the organization's state level regulatory and policy efforts and manages the legislative portfolio for numerous states. Additionally, he acts as project manager for the government relations department's fundraising efforts. He holds a law degree from Loyola University New Orleans uh, College of Law. In addition to being a past president of the Louisiana Kennel Club and past co-chair of Raleigh's RDO Day, Phil sits on the advisory committee to uh, Advisory Committee of Innovate to Motivate, the National Conference of Political Involvement of Professionals. So he'll be one of our three, along with Patty. Second, we have Adrian Hochstadt, um, CD, or, I'm sorry, JDCAE. Um, Adrian, I know from uh, my husband's involvement in his committee and from some of the other AVMA activities I've been involved with. He directs the American Vet Med Association's state legislative and regulatory initiatives. He's played a key role in creating and shaping AVMA's state advocacy program, that's the committee my husband is involved with, including monitoring and analyzing legislation, partnering with state associations in handling public policy, and enhancing the visibility of veterinary medicine with state policymakers. He's really been very instrumental in making a lot of great things happen with the AVMA. So we're pleased to have him. And then we have Pat Mixon. She's a principal at the government relations firm of Mixon and Associates. Her areas of expertise at M&A are healthcare, veterinary medical issues, agriculture, and other business and association related legislation. She works with a large group of physicians and the Florida Academy of Physician Assistants as well as the Florida Veterinary Medical Association. Pat tracks a variety of issues before the legislative and before the legislator and participates in the development of laws and rules impacting many associations and clients that the firm represents. She actively participates in legislative campaigns and organizes political action committees for the M&A's clients and trains associations and clients in the importance of grassroots political activities. And she's been really instrumental in what's gone on here in, um, in Florida. So I'm going to start off with um, Phil. We're going to have each of them do about 10 minutes. Then we're going to have you hold questions till the end, and then the panel will respond. Do I need to introduce you, Patty? Should I go through your bio? Do we all know Patty? We're good? OK. OK, great. So we're going to go ahead and start with Phil. Good morning, everybody. The idea of 10 minutes is going to be mildly entertaining to me because it's probably going to be more like 15 or 20, but I digress. And this is not the presentation. Here we go. So when Patty first contacted me about talking here today to you all, I obviously got very excited. NEIA is one of my favorite gigs, one of my favorite things to do. And she wanted me to talk a little bit about AKC and lobbying. And a lot of us say AKC and lobbying. Those are two terms you don't often hear in the same sentence, unless you're one of those people who are out there always complaining about us and that we don't lobby. Well, 
I think that really sets up a really interesting environment to start this discussion with, and that's a discussion about expectations. You know, if there's one thing we hear of all the time at AKC is a constant comparison to the NRA. Why doesn't the AKC do what the NRA does? They're so aggressive, they're so much of go-getters. Why doesn't the AKC do what they do? The simple answer is this, we're two completely different types of organizations. The NRA is a direct membership organization. You pay your money to them every year. You ascribe to their policy positions and their legisl legislative strategies and agendas. AKC is not that type of organization. We're a club of clubs. So we don't have that automatic agreement. All of these organizations that fall under AKC's umbrella really do, uh, are, are, are independent entities. So each one can make the decisions best for them. So in that environment, we utilize a grassroots empowerment model. We provide you, we believe, with the tools and the skill sets necessary to go out and impact the policy process. But a critical component of that is individual action. You know, quite frankly, we have offices in New York and in North Carolina. We're not going to be able to go to a jurisdiction like Iowa and say, hey, we know what's best for Iowa. The clubs in Iowa, the individuals in Iowa will be the best people to do that. Now, I, I kind of want to start with an apology because, quite frankly, there's a really silly pun that I'm going to use throughout this presentation. Um, it's obvious for the guy from AKC, and so I apologize that it's not really more uh, exciting, but congratulations, you're the underdogs. Like Patty alluded to a little while ago, when you are facing the AR machine in, in whatever issue you're dealing with, there is no question you are an underdog. They're powerful, they're well connected, and most likely you're not. And that's okay. America loves an underdog. We believe that anybody can rise to greatness. Think about popular culture and two wonderfully noted brands, American brands. Apple Computer. How often do we hear over and over again, Apple Computer was founded in somebody's garage? How often do we hear that Oprah Winfrey, another powerful brand, was founded from very humble beginnings in Kosciuszko, Mississippi, with, in a house without indoor plumbing? We hear it all the time. These stories help us connect with people who have achieved really wonderful things, right? And it helps us believe that we can do those same things too. That's the power of being recognized as an underdog. There's a doctor here uh, at the University of South Florida called Dr. Joe Vandello. He's done a lot of research on underdogs. And it falls under the social, so, social psycholo uh, psychology excuse me, theory called the just world theory. That theory basically says that people have a general aversion to inequality and inherently want to correct that inequality. For lawmakers, working with underdogs is one of the ways to achieve that. The point of this is, is that as an underdog, facing the challenges of an under, uh, uh, that underdogs face, we can use that label or, or that condition of being as a persuasion asset. It's noted very well throughout research, both inside of politics and out. Underdog stories about overcoming great odds through passion and determination resonate during difficult times. In the dog world, we've recently been going through those difficult times with some of the recent developments we've had. These, spot, these stories can inspire us and give us hope when the outlook is somewhat bleak. But underdogs are also recognized as resources of the most uh, sincere kind, the realist kind, if you will. Here's a quote from a former uh, congressman. Congressman Jim Ross Lightfoot of Iowa, who said, underdogs know their subject matter far better than any paid representatives, like lobbyists. Sorry, Pat. <laughs> they had built their businesses, their farm, or whatever, and knew firsthand all the challenges they'd face, as well as the consequences of actions the government has taken as, or was proposing to take against them. Now, let me be clear. I'm not comparing apples and oranges here. I, you know, Grassroots lobbying, what I'm talking about now, is one, one aspect of the whole universe of political influence. Direct professional lobbying is another. They're both wonderful. So I'm not comparing apples and oranges, but with this inherent value as a resource of, of, of being able to be that real resource of, of genuine, sincere information, underdogs also have a lot of other benefits heading their way. We have a lot of heart and a lot of grit. I come from the dog world, right? Hell hath no fury like a dog person scorned. Seriously. We are very, very defensive about our animals and our way of life. We have an amazing amount of knowledge and expertise. 
And we, we're generally always interested, not in onerous policy, but in fair policy, policy that will protect animal, varieties of animal ownership and breeding and the responsible breeding of animals. We also generally have a few resources, only a few resources. We have that expertise because we spend, however, so much time and money dedicated to our animals, we often don't have some of the other resources that other organizations have. A lot of us don't have the ability to employ a professional lobbyist to advocate on our behalf. That's okay. You can do it yourself. We also, as Patty alluded to earlier, you know, the ARs own the media. They own it. We're not generally going to have that sort of inherent uh, media bias working in our favor. It's something that the, the, the underdog will continuously have to overcome. But there's hope. We can do some of these following techniques to overcome those lack of resources. Building relationships. It's inherent to this process. I'm going to tell you a story about this lady up in Long Island called Ann Letus. Ann has Staffordshire Bull Terriers and she recognized when her dogs were starting to be the subject, the, the sort of the subject of attack for pending legislation, she realized she needed to start working to make a difference for her animals. So one of the things she did was she introduced herself in a very unique way to all of her representatives and their staff members. She baked Christmas cookies in the shape of her dogs and took them to their offices and said, hi, I'm Ann, have some cookies. And this is what I'm about, and you've probably heard from me already, and this is, I'm that person. Great. She built a relationship based on dog cookies. She went further beyond that. She added value to that relationship. As she got introduced, she took the opportunity to tell them what she can offer them, what she can do for them when they had proposals that they were going to consider. She didn't squander the resources that were available to her. She was very smart in realizing that for most legislators or policymakers, a lot of people honestly are not engaged on animal issues. They've got 10,000 other things to deal with. And when animal issues come up, they're going to listen to staff members. So as she's developing relationships with the elected officials, she's developing relationships, more importantly, with staff members who know to refer to her as an expert on these issues. And then she did something really wonderful. She over-delivered. So there was a BSL proposal in her community. She was strongly opposed to it. She was working with legislators. She actually ended up sitting with the legislator who was a sponsor of this event, of, of this proposal, as it was pending. And she said, look, I, we don't agree here. We're not going to agree here. But we need to go above and beyond what we're, your particular proposal. You're talking about outlawing my, the ownership of my breed. And that's fine. We're going to disagree on that. But what are the other things we can do? She turned it into a public education opportunity. She took our, excuse me, she took our uh, Safety Around Dogs DVD. She branded it with the representative's information. She had it distributed to all of that representative schools. It became part and part of responsible dog ownership lessons in schools. Not only did she defeat the BSL bill, but she helped build a better community. One of the most important things is that I think about underdogs, and it's a lesson that I've had to learn personally, is that don't be afraid of doing something that hasn't been done before. I think that's really important. I'll tell you a story. I'm a storyteller today. Who knew? A few years ago, we were dealing with, as most of you know, a mandatory spay-neuter bill in California. And it was a long battle, a terribly long battle. 18 months, a lot of resources were utilized in this effort. And as we're getting toward the end of the process, we see that we're in a committee hearing on, in the second, uh, second chamber, and we have a decent idea of where most votes are going to go, but there's still some undecideds. And as we're planning across multiple organizations of who's going to testify and what the testimony is going to be, it comes to light that we have a star that's going to be able to make an appearance. And that was, the, at that time, the latest version of Lassie. She was going to be able to make an appearance with her. He guy. I'm not necessarily interested in theatrics. I'm more interested in what's good on paper and what's good sound policy. And I thought, this is dumb. I'll be honest, I thought it was just silly. It's not going to make a difference. It made all the difference in the world. And I was never happier to be wrong. I was so excited. You know, the handler went around, went to offices, appeared in the committee, and basically made the argument, if 1634 was law now, this dog would not exist. Your beloved Lassie would not exist. And I believe, and I've been told by several people, that that ultimately made the difference. Those things, thinking outside the box, 
really helps the underdogs to succeed. Perceptions matter. So here's some of the keys, right? Be yourself. Everyone's taken. If you're a crazy dog person, you're always going to be the crazy dog person. You're going to be compared to the colorful cast of characters in the movie Best in Show. It's going to happen. Get used to it. Honor it. Celebrate it. It's who we are. Patience is key. I'm going to talk a little bit about that this a, a, a bit more when I wind up my comments, but patience is key. A lot of the work we do doesn't result in overnight success. It takes months. It takes years. Don't call yourself the underdog. It's always better when somebody else applies that label. It just gives you a little bit more of credibility. And the last bullet point I added this morning because I thought about it a lot as I was reviewing this presentation, so it's not up here. It's avoid extremism. Again, thinking about 1634, when we were listening to our opponents on the issue, we realized a lot of inconsistencies in their claims. Some days they were claiming that California had 100,000 dog and cat euthanizations in a year. Some days it was 250,000. Some days it was a million. Some days it was over a million. Some days that was applied to the whole of the United States as opposed to just California. What we were able to do is take all the publicly discoverable information of all the different claims that the, the other side had made. We charted them and we distributed it as a talking point saying, look, these people may be very good at getting a talking point on television, but they're not necessarily interested in, in promoting sound research. And I think that was an incredibly important idea. Don't be extreme, be sound. It adds to your credibility. All of this leads to how, what can we do? How do we do things? This is Civics 101, guys. This is the kind of stuff when you have a law or a rule that's passed or enacted that you don't like, you have options. The only time you will not have options is when the federal government ceases to exist or the governments of the United States cease to exist or you pass on. And by that point, you got other issues to worry about. <laughs> you can always go back to your legislature to get, le to get statutes changed. You can work with rule makers to get, ru get rules changed. You can wait till a new administration's in and you can pursue other avenues of redress. Now, all that being said, what can we do at AKC to help you? We offer two types of assistance, personalized and material resources. Personalized assistance runs the gamut. I'm going to run through these really quickly because I know I'm already over on time, but bill and ordinance analysis, if you have something pending in your community, you don't know what it really does, you need some help, call me. Nancy Fisk and I talk five times a week because we are, you know, we work well together. That's what we do. That's what we're there for. Call us. Let us know. You want specialized data. You find something that maybe you haven't seen before. You want us to produce that information. We can do that for you. We can facilitate the contact with legislators, staff members as well. Educational outreach. We offer awards to legislators and groups based on those who are doing really wonderful work on behalf of responsible dog breeders and owners. We also have our uh, legislative conference every other year to help uh, train our advocates. Material resources, akc.org slash government relations. Remember that. I know I get, I get a lot of people who say they hate the website, they don't know where to go for anything. Just remember that. akc.org slash government relations takes you right to our home on OKC's website. You're able to find the wealth of information we have available there. A ton of information, I might add. Anything from policy position papers to our legislative alerts, our legislation tracking system. It's updated daily. It shows every piece of federal and state legislation that we're tracking, it's there. Printable materials, uh, position statements, issue briefs, all of this is available to download at your convenience. More ways we can help. Advocacy training and materials, data and background information. Legislative alerts, if you think we need to target a legislative alert we, uh, to a certain group of people, we can go into clubs, we can go into geographic regions, we can go into street level if we need to, to get data out. Policy briefs, online educational presentations on any of our topical issues, we have presentations already available online that you can download and show to your clubs or to your organizations that starts getting the conversation going about these policy issues and, and the different sides of the debate. Again, if there's anything that you think you need and you don't see on our website or you don't have in some other venue, call us. We are a department of five and a half people and we cover the entire state, but we get a lot of work done and we can create specialized materials on your issues. Now, just to wind it all up, 
You're the strong underdog. You're starting the conversation. You're working with people. You're, you're deciding how you want to move things forward. And you utilize some of the materials and the resources we have at AKC to help you really achieve your, great, your, your best result. Great things can happen up in Maine right now. There's some really wonderful work going on with the Maine Federation of Dog Clubs, our federation up there. About five years ago, some bad legislation passed by the animal welfare director, in the, uh, promoted by the animal welfare director in the state. And it was really hard hitting for a lot of hobby breeders. I started working with the Maine Federation then to see what we can do. How can we address the situation? Over the course of these years, we've documented the unintended consequences, the harsh results of the legislation. We've worked with the Federation to see where we would, where we would be happy to improve the state of things in Maine, especially statutorily. We then, as this process is going on, they're getting their, their efforts out to legislators, introducing themselves, talking about their positions, making things work. They work with one legislator who says, I not only want to sponsor what you want to achieve here, I want to champion it for you. So earlier this year, a bill was introduced, and I thought, you have done more with this effort than anything that has ever been done in Maine. Congratulations, this is an amazing achievement, because I thought, based on the legislative environment in Maine, the bill had no chance. The bill lives today. It's been assigned to a work group headed by the new director of the Department of Animal Welfare in the state, who's helping address the ongoing grievances the Federation and responsible dog owners have with uh, the existing issues in Maine statutory law. It's been a long process. It's been a years long process, but it works. I'll be here all day today. I'll be here all day tomorrow. I know you have questions and comments and concerns and all that kind of stuff. I'm here to help. Thank you all very much. Good morning. That was the hard part of the presentation. Make sure that that slides up. Uh, I can relax now. Uh, it's a pleasure uh, to be here with you this morning. Um, I'm Adrian Hoxted. I'm the Assistant Director for State Legislative and Regulatory Affairs at the American Veterinary Medical Association. And you may think I'm a veterinarian, but I'm not. Um, I actually have a legal background. I have a law degree. Um, I work with some wonderful veterinarians uh, at the AVMA who are experts in many, many areas. So I'm very grateful that they're in the building but I have a legal background. Uh, my department is one of two and a half. We have a consultant also. And we, um, you know, uh, my associate Tara Southwell is also an attorney and we've been doing this work since 2005 when the AVMA decided that it needs to get a little more proactive in the area of state legislation. Uh, we've been lobbying in Washington, D.C. Uh, we have an office there for probably 50 plus years, but uh, we noticed uh, probably the same things that you noticed in recent years, that um, a lot of issues we care about are decided at the state level, whether it's by the legislature or by regulatory agencies. So if you're going to have a conversation, uh, state decision makers are a big part of that conversation. Okay. Let's see. Got it. Well, I have to um, have as my next slide. Um, my, my pets, who I have to report to after these meetings, so Muffin and, um, and Cleo, have a big stake in, uh, in what I do uh, at the office, so this is an obligatory slide. Um, so let me talk a little bit about just state advocacy, um, some of the mechanics and why we, you know, we do what we do. And then at the end, um, I want to share with you some AVMA projects and resources that I think you might be interested in. Um, you know, I, when I started with AVMA, I didn't realize um, the breadth of the issues that we deal with, you know, in veterinary medicine and if you're an animal owner. Um, I mean, there's thousands and thousands of bills, literally, every year, and I'll get into that a little bit. But it's also a growing industry. Americans spend a lot of money on their pets. And um, not surprisingly, a lot of professions and uh, interest groups um, have an interest in uh, either getting a piece of that or they may have ideological interests. Like our friends um, in the animal rights movement, they're probably driven more by ideology. But, you know, in veterinary medicine, we're dealing uh, 
also with um, a lot of other professions, my own attorneys and pharmacies and big box retailers, non-veterinarians who increasingly are doing work on, on animals, and um, it's keeping us very busy. As far as public policy at the state level, um, you know, with all of these interest groups and professionals uh, increasingly paying attention to animal rights, animal law, uh, veterinary medicine, um, you know, the lesson that I have for the veterinarians, we do a lot of training as well, um, and, you know, we talk to uh, the leadership in our state VMAs, and um, it's amazing. When veterinarians are involved in public policy, we seem to do pretty well. Um, as, as Phil said, a lot of legislators, you know, they, they don't have a background, uh, certainly not in, in medicine. They don't have a background even in a lot of the, the knowledge they, that we all have. And, you know, when veterinarians are involved, when they are a resource to legislators, the results seem to be a lot better than uh, situations where um, the other side pretty much dominates the conversation. I mean, there's one example. Rhode Island, for example, has a guardianship law uh, fortunately, it hasn't really been tested, um, you know, but they have language in three or four places in their statutes that refer to guardian slash owners. And, you know, we're not sure what that means or will mean or how it's going to be used, but a big part of that law being passed about 10 years ago is I know that veterinary medicine really was not engaged uh, at that point. There were some, um, some gaps in, in leadership. People were, you know, there were vacancies in certain positions. And next thing you know, there's a guardianship law in the United States, in a state. You know, so being at the table is absolutely critical. And so this is the, the play the game. Um, and it goes for veterinarians, and I think it's equally applicable uh, to NAIA. You know, uh, be involved, it makes a huge difference. Um, you, you may be an underdog, but if you're at the table, you can make a big impact. If you're not there, you can predict the results. And the good news, I think, you know, I work at the state level, the good news is I think it's, um, it's much more doable than dealing with Congress. You know, you're looking at uh, smaller districts, first of all. The legislators are much more accessible. They're more really down to earth. You know, they're mostly everyday folks that if you call or if you send an email, I mean, you may hear from them uh, the same day. They may actually answer their emails and you may, you know, or you may actually get the person on the phone. So, if you want to get involved at the state level, you can make a big difference. And, I mean, I have examples where one well-connected veterinarian actually helped amend a bill by himself just because of the people he knew. So don't think that one person can't make a difference because at the local level, that's not true. You can. Now, we, we tell veterinarians, and again, a, a lot of these messages are, a, a apply across the board. If you can work with, um, with a group, if you can work with um, you know, an organization. You know, in our case, it's the state veterinary medical associations. Every state has one. And, and by the way, we don't lobby. I don't, you can't really lobby at the local level from uh, Schaumburg, Illinois, or, or Washington, D.C. You, you have to have the relationships in, in place. So we work with the state VMAs. But collection, co collective action is, is more effective. Um, but you look at the resources an organization can put together. The Florida VMA has access to PAT. Most of us don't have a PAT uh, <laughs> who can keep track, uh, you know, in Tallahassee and actually um, be there on a daily basis. You know, we don't have PACs. You know, we don't have legislative committees. But organizations can pull all of those resources together, and they're they're very effective. Um, so, you know, you're already involved in an AIA, but uh, any sort of state level organizations that you can put together are much more effective than you going out as an individual uh, and lobby by yourself. Now, that's not to say you can't do anything by yourself, because you can. Um, again, relationships matter, especially at the state level. They're not that difficult. Uh, you should all know your state senator and your state representative. That shouldn't be very difficult. And if you do some of these things, um, you know, I, the, the, the best piece of advice, if you want to get to know your legislator, you volunteer to help him or her uh, in a campaign, you walk a precinct with them and they will always remember who you are. It's, it's even better than contributing money because you have that per personal connection. They will always at least listen to what you have to say. And I just want to give you a, and there's probably no surprise here, um, the breadth of issues that we're dealing with at AVMA. Um, you know, a lot of the things that you're all interested in. 
Um, again, I didn't realize when I started AVMA that there would be so many issues. I worked with physicians and lawyers in, in previous associations, and I just couldn't believe the, there, there's so many measures that touch um, animal health, you know, um, and, and uh, animal ownership in some way. So we have our hands full at AVMA, um, and you know, we do have a legislative tracking system that is probably our number one service. If we just do one thing for the state VMAs, it's, it's, it's this. We track, uh, monitor, and report uh, daily on the bills and regulatory agency proposals that we find. We have an electronic system that flags certain key terms, and you can look at some of the, you know, the scope of the numbers. Out of 150,000 bills introduced last year, uh, probably about four or 5,000 were worthy of careful scrutiny, and uh, we sent over 2,000 alerts to the state VMAs, and it's basically, hey, heads up, you know, a bill was introduced in your state, um, or a bill passed in your state, and beyond that, um, at times they need a little more assistance from us at AVMA, and we provide other services such as analyzing a bill, uh, looking at what other states have done with the same issue, and sometimes we get a little more directly involved, but it's, you know, it's always the VMA runs the show locally, and so, you know, if you have an issue in your state, uh, and, and, and I, I strongly urge you to work with the state VMAs, uh, you probably want to do that first before the AVMA because they are uh, basically in charge in what's happening in their state. Very rarely do we have a disagreement at the national level with the state VMA. So, um, you know, reach out to your state VMAs. Um, I personally, I would tell you, you probably should know who the state VMA executive director is if you're active locally, um, know their lobbyists, and uh, you know, be in touch with them because they are a critical component of any coalition that you might be interested in. The AVMA also does some outreach. Uh, we go to meetings and conferences and events that we really can't expect our state VMAs uh, to have the resources to do. So you know, we'll go to the National Conference of State Legislators where two of those uh, photos are from. We'll have a booth. We always see our friends at Feld, they have a booth. And about, oh, 10 to 15 uh, animal welfare, animal protection, animal rights organizations uh, also have booths. So again, <laughs> you know, you have to show up. And, uh, you know, we try to go to, uh, we, we can't really go everywhere, but we try to go to Council of State Government, sometimes the National Governors Association. Again, it's just to make sure that these decision makers know uh, what veterinarians do, and we want to offer ourselves as a resource when these issues come up so they go to us and not some other groups. A special program I, I want to um, mention is our AVMA Legal Outreach Program. Uh, we've been doing this for about five years. One of those professions that's very interested in animal issues that I mentioned earlier uh, is my own, attorneys. And uh, we've noticed that uh, more and more law schools have either animal law courses or clinics or chapters of the uh, ALDF, the uh, Animal Legal Defense Fund, which is uh, closely aligned with HSUS. And more and more bar associations are starting um, you know, their own animal law committees. So we felt that the veterinary perspective was not being offered in most of these events, whether they're panels or presentations or meetings. Uh, so we, you know, we recruited some, some speakers who are aligned with AVMA. A lot of them are veterinarians, a lot of them are lawyers, some are both, uh, like, like Marty, the DVMJDs, which is amazing to me, how somebody can, uh, um, can get both. That's, that's really impressive. But we, we do have about 25 speakers. Some are um, actually staff, I've done some of them. And you know, we solicit law schools and bar associations and tell them we have a number of issues we can talk about. Uh, if you'd like to invite us, you know, we'll, it'd be no cost to you. We'll come in and do a presentation. Uh, for the first three, four years, uh, most of the presentations concern non-economic damages. You know, that was a big, big issue at the time. And now we're getting requests for some other things, uh, mandatory reporting by veterinarians of animal abuse. You know, for some reason, that's, that's kind of a hot issue with with the lawyers that are interested in this. But and I, I, I see this as a critical program to try to reach out to law students. And, and by the way, most of the law students who take these courses, and these are small classes, they're generally um, electives, you know, seven, eight, 10 students. They're not generally 
activists, you know, like we feared. We thought, well, it was, this is going to be a really hostile environment. Um, you'll have a couple of those, and, and you'll have professors who fall into that camp, although not all of them do. Um, but we had very good reception uh, from most of the students who came up to us after the presentations and said, you know, gee, I never thought of it that way. There's another side to some of these issues. It's more complicated, isn't it? Um, so I feel really good when, when I hear that because, yes, you know, um, in the interest of legal discourse, we want to make sure that they have both sides. And again, if, when there's an honest conversation, we do pretty well with, with these issues. It's when we're not there I'm concerned about. It. And these are going to be the attorneys and judges of the future who are going to be hearing cases. So, you know, it, this is a critical program. We're looking to really re-energize it and, and perhaps expand it with the help of some partners uh, to be able to do more of, of what we've done. Because so, some of the ideologue professors now are reluctant to invite us. <laughs> so in a way, our numbers have gone down a little bit in certain places. So we want to re-energize uh, re this program. But if any of you have connections at, at law schools, if you know professors or deans, or even the students who run these chapters, you know, a lot of them are going to be receptive to having you know, all sides and all perspectives come in and, uh, and do a talk. And again, you know, we'll, uh, we have a budget for this, and there's no cost to the institution. So we'd appreciate anybody's help with this program. We really um, think this is essential in moving forward. One um, last note, uh, we also have some resources on our website, avma.org. Um, and almost all the documents on our website are public uh, to anybody. If you go to our homepage, you'll, uh, you'll look, um, well, not exactly like this, but if you click on advocacy, if you look at those bars at the top, you click on advocacy, you will see a number of options, state and local issues. So if you click on that, you will uh, have access to state legislative updates. That's a document that we um, post every month. Some of the highlights from around the country on bills and regulations that impact veterinary medicine. I know there will be lots of issues you're also interested in. Um, twice a year we put out something a little more comprehensive, a topical, issue by issue, more in-depth analysis of what we're seeing at the state level around the country. On the left-hand side there, there are a number of issues that we put out backgrounders and sample letters and 50 state charts. So they might be helpful to you in your work as well. And with that, um, it brings me to the end of the presentation, and I'm, I think we're all going to be available for questions at the end. So thank you for your attention. Good morning. I'm Pat Mixon, and I do not have a PowerPoint, but I'm wearing a very powerful red suit today. <laughs> when I go to the Capitol, I always wear red. That way everybody can find me if they're up there working. I, I have some friends here that I'm going to recognize in the audience in a minute, but I always wear my bright red or my bright blue when I'm working in the Capitol and I have constituents or friends there so they can find me in that bivy of activity that goes on in the, in the legislature. Um, I want to tell you real quickly a little bit about myself because I've been labeled the lobbyist. Um, I won't let my husband use that word. He, he came from the year of being lobbyist. I am not a lobbyist. I am a governmental consultant. <laughs> because lobbyist is somebody, apparently, in the old days that everyone thinks walks around with a paper sack of money to deliver to someone. Um, that is not what we are. Um, governmental consultants are people who educate. And someone last night said to me, um, who had been a staffer in Washington for many, many years, that if a lobbyist ever told one lie, they were finished. So a lobbyist, really, or a governmental consultant, is the person who comes in and tries to educate and advocate. And it's a very different role in today's society than when we call the pork chopper days in Florida. Um, a little bit about myself. I am a fifth generation Floridian. I know that's a rarity. I'm a rare bird. And um, I grew up in the panhandle. We do have a panhandle. It's very rural. It's very agricultural. My grandfather was the first agriculture ag extension agent in our county. Um, Jackson County, and um, I was raised going to all of his farms. He owned three farms. A little closer. He owned three form, farms, and um, I grew up understanding um, working animals, food animals. I had my ponies, then I had my horses, then I had every kind of dog you could possibly imagine. I remember the days when they used to churn butter on the farm. I understand animals as a part of that entire scheme, and it was the way our life was in, in a rural community. Um, I have a great love for animals. I wanted to be a veterinarian, but then I realized that women during my era could only be teachers or housewives. 
Um, now I'm very excited to see that most veterinarians are women, and I'm very excited about that. Um, so I do have a, an extreme love for animals, and when I was contacted several years ago by the FEMA um, to lobby with them, it was actually through working on a health care bill that they um, got to know me and uh, asked me if I would be their support lobbyist because I'm really more of an analyst. I love to get into a bill and in 15 minutes I can find all the things it will do to you that no one in the whole room knew it was going to do to you. And um, if you just skim over a bill, you think, oh, that's not so bad. It's the devil is in the details when it comes to legislation. How many of you, let's raise your hands, how many of you have ever met your state legislator? Even one. Okay, very good. How many of you have ever gone to a city commission meeting and spoke on an issue? Very good. How many of you have ever gone to a county meeting and spoke on an issue? Okay, now you are the cream of the crop, and not every hand went up. So some of you guys out there have some work to do. Okay, when you leave this meeting, go meet your local legislator, go meet your county commissioner, go meet your city commissioner. It is, that is the battleground. These are our resources, the NAI Trust and PADI, the um, AKC, the FEMA, and the AVMA. Those are your resources. But when it comes to it, we here in the state are at the battleground. We can't outspend them. We can't out-PR them. All we can do is use our resources, our people, and our advocacy here in, in the local area to do work. And I'm going to introduce you to two of my resources. I'd like Leah James and um, Susan Smith to stand up. And they need a, a round of applause. Everybody, as they have said on both of the presentations here, each person in this room can make a difference. The problem is, is you are the people making the difference. The issue is getting out to the people in the community who want to do something but have no clue how to do it. And you've had some really good things shown on the PowerPoints today about how you get involved. These are our resources, but the states, the cities, and the counties are the battlegrounds. That is where all the activities are going on right now in the animal welfare versus animal rights arena. And I can tell you that Florida after California was the next lowest hanging fruit. And five years ago when I got involved with the FVMA and then with the FAKC, I had no idea what I was getting involved in, not a clue. Suddenly I'm there and everybody's calling me and I'm looking at bills. We had mandatory spay and neuter of every dog under the age of four months. Yes, every dog under the age of four months. That was actually a bill filed here in Florida. We had the commercial breeding bill. This thing was probably 15 pages long. It went the gamut from warrantless search and seizure to getting on your computer, coming on your property, accessing your computer records, um, telling you exactly the size of your kennel, how big a cage could be. I have Joseph and Finley who sleep together. They were gonna have to no longer cohabitate. This bill told you exactly how big every kennel had to be. It had to have a roof, it had to have this. Um, we have had the pet welfare bill this past year and the pet, wel pet welfare bill would raise, allow any county to raise ad valorem property taxes. Ad valorem property taxes as you would for school millage um, for a special taxing district to fund animal welfare. In Miami-Dade alone, we figured that would be over $20 million for animal welfare. And then they were going to open up adoption, build these Taj Mahal adoption areas so people wouldn't have to see how unpleasant it is in a shelter or a humane rescue. And they would take the animals there and there was no local oversight. The voters had no right to recall anyone placed on that commission. The taxes would be raised every year and there was no vote, no ability to go back to the voters to repeal the bill. 20 million just in one county. I'll let you all figure out how, what that would be um, all over the state of Florida. So these are the type of bills when I first started working with the um, VM, FEMA and the FAKC that I was faced with and I'm sitting here going, oh my gosh, what have I gotten myself into? I can't, how do I do this? Well then I suddenly realized we did have resources. We reached out. Leah and Susan started coming to Tallahassee, but then I realized there was a second part of this. No one had a clue how to work to oppose these bills because the PR had been so strong for so long 
the um, workshops had been held to teach people how to go out and advocate for animal rights. We were starting so far behind. We have a saying, and he sort of alluded to it earlier, if you're not at the table, you're on the table. You see all these elephants? They're on the table. Okay, this group here is at the table. And for the longest time, we have sat back and thought, oh my gosh, wringing our hands, what are we gonna do? My grandfather used to say, quit worrying about the mule going blind and just load the wagon. So, <laughs> I'm serious, I want y'all to remember that. My granddaughter has finally understood the value of that statement. Don't worry about the mule going blind, just load the wagon. And I will tell you, when this all started, we got Leah up there, we got Susan up there, we got several groups, we had a meeting in the Capitol, and we quit wringing our hands and we said, okay, can we let them here in Florida pass a bill that says they can come onto our property, search our computer records, take our animals? Can we do that? Can we sit here and let that happen? No. So what are we going to do? We started loading our wagon. We started figuring out who wouldn't like that other than dog people. We started thinking, okay, who's the greatest advocate for personal rights? The NRA and they have a Huntsman Association. We started thinking, who would be concerned about some of these requirements? The veterinarians would be concerned. We started taking this commercial breeder bill and we started picking it apart and we found every group that would have a problem with any sentence in that bill. And we called a meeting. This groups never got, these groups had never gotten together before. No one had ever called the Cattlemen's Association. We'd never called the NRA. I mean, this was all new territory. But we quit wringing our hands and we started calling and we set meetings. And we started getting together with groups and determining what part of that bill they didn't like. And believe me, once we sat down and picked it apart, there were a lot of parts that nobody liked. And we actually went to the hearing. It actually got a hearing in the Senate. And we had done our work. Each group had gone out and picked out their part, like, okay, I really don't like the thought that they're going to be able to come on my property without a warrant, take my animals, and then go get on my computer and see what my breeding records say or what my sales records say. It was frightening. I'll just tell you, personally frightening for me that this bill had even been written and no one had a problem with it. Well, I will tell you that by the end of that committee meeting, the bill was TP'd, the bill did not pass, and we finally had issues. It wasn't screaming and yelling against, oh, this or that. It was we had some very firm beliefs among our groups that our personal property rights and our ability to protect our home and our property was very important. Even the animal control officers, because let me tell you the one fatal flaw the other side made when they came to Florida. Florida is not California. <laughs> We are not California. We have a very liberal south, southern part of the state, and we have the Bible Belt, conservative northern part of the state. We are still very much in the northern part of Florida, an agricultural state. They did not realize that. So when you start talking about coming on my property, now do remember that we are unfortunately the stand your ground state. But here was the co comment made when we brought in the animal control officers we do not want this part of the bill to pass because we're the ones who are going to have to come on the property and these people have guns. <laughs> so they took exception right away. So there was, we played for once, we weren't just on the defensive, we were looking at, okay, how can we be on the defensive but make it a positive in the state? And we had people in our state who, form, who strongly believed that animals should be treated humanely but they also firmly believe that we have rights as Americans to bear arms, to protect our families, to protect our properties, and I don't think the other side took that into consideration. So each of you from different states needs to go back and look at your state and look at your strengths. I'll give you an example of the county level situation that Leah and I worked on because we're both from Leon County, and I will tell you, it is very helpful to have an advocate like that who lives in the city where the capital is and where we're meeting. The Wednesday before Thanksgiving, two years ago, it was advertised that Leon County was going to rewrite the entire, had rewritten the entire animal code for Leon County and it would be heard the next Monday, the Monday after Thanksgiving, and they would vote it out and pass it in its entirety. 
the Wednesday night before Thanksgiving. Now, how many people do you think were available the Wednesday night? What are you doing the Wednesday night before Thanksgiving? Cooking. Okay. So I'm sitting there going, oh my gosh. And I'm reading this thing. And it's things like, um, okay, no dog or cat can be on a private road without a leash. A private road. Again, warrantless search and seizure. I'm reading this and I'm going, oh my gosh, this is going to pass Monday night. They're going to have a brief hearing. I started thinking, who does this impact the most? And I thought it impacts me as a dog owner. What do we have in Tallahassee? We have plantation land. What do we have on plantations? We have hunters. What happens on plantations? Animals are loose on that property, private property at all times. They have private roads. The only thing I could come up with on the Wednesday night before Thanksgiving was I'm going to reach out to Kevin's Sporting Goods because he's a big plantation guy. I reached out to Tall Timbers. I reached out to every plantation owner I could find because we have plantations still in the panhandle. And man, they had the city commission on speed dial. <laughs> they were my advocates. And that was the hardest pull it out, figure it out I've ever had is who would, who is still not cooking because I knew they were all going hunting on Saturday. But who would care about the fact that this ordinance says you cannot allow a dog to walk on private property without a leash? And you know what? They all got busy. They made phone calls. It came up on Monday night. It came up on Monday night, and it did not pass. It was pulled off the agenda, and we were allowed to work on it, and we got the warrantless search and seizure out. We got the can't roam on private property, and we were able to stop it. So you need to go back to your states and look at the local situation within the counties and the cities and say, who are my people in this community who feel strongly about private property rights? Who are my people that feel strongly about the right to own animals? Who are the people who care and would get involved? Now, that's the tough part. You can figure out who they are, but you've got to get them involved. That is the tough part, and that's the part that I would charge each and every one of you to go back and do. I know that Tina, um, our club, our Cavalier King Charles Spaniel Club, paid for a person to come to this meeting because we felt it was that important. But she has committed, because I preach at every one of our meetings, if you're not willing to get involved, then you have to suffer the consequences. So you need to go back. You're here because it's important to you and because you're an advocate. You need to go back and find a Tina, find a Leah, find a Susan and get them involved on the local level. Get them to commit to come to the city commission meetings. Get them to commit to come to the county commission meetings. Get them committed and make sure you give them then the tools which these wonderful organizations have given you to do that. And I don't have very much longer to speak, but I will tell you that we have gone in five years from being always in a defensive mode to last year saying this is it. We're tired of defending ourselves. We're going to go on the offense. And we took the shelter reporting bill that NAI Trust had proposed. We didn't get the whole loaf. We always say John and I are, are like crumb people in legislation. If you can't get the whole loaf, take the crumbs because you can later on do something with those crumbs. You can get sustenance from those crumbs and you can build on it. So what we did is we took the model legislation that NIA Trust had proposed for shelter reporting. It took us three years. But for once, we weren't on the defensive. The other organizations were having to work. They weren't just advertising and throwing out flyers. They actually had to come to the Capitol. They had to get involved because we had legislation that said we are going to, in Florida, have a bill that will track what's happening in shelters. And it started out as a shelter reporting bill. And we got together the um, Animal Control Officers Association, the NRA, the FAKC, the Veterinarian Association. We pulled together all these groups and we started meeting with the aides to the um, uh, Chairman of Agriculture in the Senate. And we met and met and met until we could come up with some language we could live with. And we now in Florida have a shelter reporting bill because every meeting we went to, as you said, they get up and say 300,000 animals are euthanized in this county a month. Then it was one million. I mean, every time I went to a meeting, it was a million, it was 300,000. We don't know. Nobody knows what's happening. And so our bill in Florida now requires that every shelter, every humane rescue, whether profit or not for profit, must keep records. It doesn't require them to give them to anyone yet. But they must keep it as I, if I as a citizen go in to a shelter now 
or go into the Tallahassee Humane Society, they have to have on hand the records and they must provide me the records of how many animals came in, how many animals went out, how many were abandoned, how many were picked up, how many were um, surrendered by owner, how many were euthanized, how many were adopted. We cannot get to the problem in the animal situation in this country until we have data to know what the problem is. And I got so tired of not knowing what the problem was and chasing it. And at first I was uncomfortable a little bit with this, but what we have done in Florida is we have passed that bill, it is in law, it went into law on July 1st, and we can actually start now collect, collecting data so we know what the problem is and we can solve it. And I think this was an incredible bill that they helped us with, and we could not have done it without all of these people. And it is time that each and every one of you get involved on your local level to quit being on the defense. We cannot win if we're always running. You have to stop and stand and think about what can I win and move forward winning that. And that is the one message I would leave with you, is we can't run and hide. We can't win the PR campaign, but we can start very calmly and professionally representing ourselves in the Capitol, at city council meetings and in commission meetings, and we can start very calmly giving our message and telling people what is important to us, and I would charge each of you to do that, and I look forward to talking with you all this week. This week. Thank you. Um, as I mentioned at the beginning uh, when I was welcoming everybody, actually NAIA has two groups. NAIA is the educational organization. It's the 501c3 animal welfare educational organization. Then we have NAIA Trust, and it's located at naiatrust.org. And this is the organization through which we do uh, take legislative action. Um, the, the focus of our group, we are grassroots, I think, that's one of the things we're talking about here is being so important. We are totally grassroots. We work with um, all the different organizations that we've been talking about, but we also work with individuals who don't have an organization to belong to. Um, we have members in every state that we work with. We occasionally hire lobbyists, but typically we're working with our own people who are constituents within a given community. Um, collaboration is a really big deal with us. I'm going to run through these in individual slides in a minute. Uh, we are an issues research and development organization so that when issues such as pet overpopulation or issues such as um, you know, all commercial breeders or puppy mills, these kinds of things come up, we work on collecting the information to show what the real story is. Um, we also develop model laws, as Pat mentioned. We have a congressional newsletter, which is on the back desk there by the, by the sign-up. And we have an, a new, excellent legislative platform, which I'll share with you as we go along. I'm going to go through this pretty quickly. I think you guys, most of the people here know what we have. So, okay, we're widespread. Um, our grassroots, we're in just about every, every state. We work with an evidence sort of based um, presentations. We are the ones who prepare the data, take it in, and educate the lawmakers, as Pat was talking about earlier. Again, um, our, our group is, is very, very diverse. We have people who are involved with cattle and sheep growing. We have people involved with rodeos, and we have research scientists, biology teachers, dog and cat enthusiasts. I mean, I just, I think we're probably the most diverse group that's ever existed, actually. Um, and we're very, very flexible in, in the work that we do. And we're flexible, again, because we're working with individuals that don't have to punch a time clock. I'm very often talking to people I don't know how, much, how many times you've noticed this, but about 3 o'clock in the afternoon on Friday is when a lot of really bad stuff gets introduced or when you first get a glimpse of it. And we'll be talking with people in our group over the weekend and into the late hours of the night, so we're, we're not sort of limited by uh, anything normal, I guess you'd say. Uh, collaboration, this is just really our model. This is Benjamin Franklin, and he's the guy who said, if we don't hang together, then we shall surely hang separately. So again, just trumpeting what Pat said a minute ago about finding out who else, might, who else is being affected by a given law and pulling them into the conversation and beginning to work with them, and that's what we do. 
Um, again, issue campaign development, that's our big deal. The uh, four major issues that we've worked on, animal rights extremism, declining shelter and household dog populations, humane relocation, dog trafficking, and purebreds as an endangered species. So I'll just run th through those really quickly. Most of you know the book we did on animal rights extremism, the hijacking of the humane movement. Um, within the NAIA website, uh, we have a, a very big section that deals with animal rights extremism. You just go into the main website and then go to the resources section and go to the case against animal rights extremism. And I think it's one of the most complete in terms of having information in it that you can actually use, whether it's quotes from the leaders of the animal rights movement. We have a chronology of criminal activity on the part of animal rights extremists that goes back into the early 80s. Um, we have one of the more recent things that we've added is something called deception in the name of animal rights. And it's very, very helpful in fighting some of the, um, for the people in the ag community because we have um, various court cases and decisions that, you know, during the course of a given trial, it was proven that instead of the owner hurting his animals, the activist himself was involved in, in, um, in doing bad things. And so it's very, very helpful when you're working on agricultural issues right now in particular. Um, on the front of shelter populations, I think we've done, frankly, more than any, any group in the country. We have the best data. Um, this is our little construct called uh, the NAIA Shelter Project. If you go to the, again, the home page of NAIA, right up in the upper right-hand corner, you can click on an icon for the Shelter Project. And we have, I know Maddie's fund is, is very, very big too, but I think we have four times as much data as Maddie's fund. And is Barbara Reichman here somewhere? Barbara Reichman. Again, volunteer based. She does this work <laughs> night and day. And what's really wonderful about the Shelter Project is for any of the states, and now Florida is one that is collecting some data too, but there are a number of states in the country. Colorado, for Linda Hart here, is prob probably has the best data in the United States. What's really good about their data is they not only have um, the number of animals that were taken in, the number of animals that were adopted back out, the euthanizations, and, and so on. But they also require the um, shelters and rescues to report where they get their animals, and whether it's from in-state or out-of-state. Well, this has been a real boon to us. Uh, I don't think Colorado is much different than many of the other northern states. And this little chart that I put up on the screen represents the uh, number of dogs that they that top line there is for the number of dogs that they import every year from out of state. And it's about 13,000 dogs a year. That is enough to completely saturate the market. It's certainly enough to cause hobby breeders to quit breeding because the market isn't there anymore. And it, it is a systematic sort of uh, approach that we're dealing with now. Virtually every state in the north is getting this kind of flood. We don't know where all the dogs are coming from. We know some of them are coming from Mexico and Puerto Rico. And if you're on the west coast, some of them are coming from China. And they advertise it now. I mean, it's out in the, it's wide open now. Used to be hidden. And uh, on the score of humane relocation, this is the front page article we got in USA Today when I think we brought this story forward. This is 2000, 2003, January 2003. And uh, the, it, it was pretty good. He said, um, the author commented that, um, that some of these dogs that were coming into the country were from China and different places like that. So it was very helpful to have it out. And we've done some campaigns around humane relocation, developed some logos and things to help people to start the conversation. Um, this is an example of a graph from a shelter in Illinois that is that started up to do nothing but humane relocation. And they're all over the place. Massachusetts probably has a dozen of them. This one started in 2005, and they're importing over 1,000 dogs a, a year now, just by themselves. But there, there's just scores and scores of these shelters all over the place now. We've done some media campaigns on purebred dogs, as if you saw this. Yeah, OK, it's, it's been out on the internet. Went almost viral, so. Um, 
And then we are completing a dog study that we've been working on for the last two years. We just lost our lead scientist, Dr. John New, just a fabulous gentleman we've been working with for a long time, just passed away a couple of weeks ago. Um, at the, it is going to be very similar, I think, to the AVMA's uh, work that you, the wonderful work that you do on demographics, but a little different orientation. We're just asking little different kind of questions than, than yours or what are asked in the APPA. And along with the demographic kind of questions that we're asking, we also thought that it was time that somebody challenged what we've heard for the last 30 years, that 25% of dogs in shelters are purebreds. So we are doing a study, and we've been working in all nine census areas uh, looking at municipal shelters and looking at private shelters and literally having somebody count the number of purebred dogs that they say they have and then analyzing the pictures of the dogs that they claim are pure and you go from 25 percent to somewhere around 10 11 percent right away if you believe what they tell you and then when you analyze the pictures it drops to about six percent and then, of course, an awful lot of those dogs are um, supposed to be pit bull terriers, Amstaffs, but they are pit bull-like. And so even in that 6%, they, they probably aren't truly purebred. So, and that will be out in another couple of months. Uh, model laws, as Pat mentioned, um, we, we do create model laws. And I would thank Julian Prager, who's sitting there by the projector right now. Um, wonderful. <laughs> He is our legislative analyst, and when we have a concept, when we think a particular uh, type of law is in order, we get the concept all drafted out, and then Julian puts it together into a model law that can be used. And by the way, you'll, if you come to our website and you look at our model laws, you won't find a model law that you want to use just exactly like it is. The model laws are there to give you ideas and to draw from, but if you in most places in the country, you're going to have to integrate what we have into an existing law. So just come take a look and, and borrow what you'd like. As Pat said, when you are working proactively, when you are introducing a law such as the Shelter Reporting Act, or in our case, we also have the Shelter Import and Reporting Act, it occupies the bad guys, quite frankly. I mean, they, they get so upset that they, they give up all the other legislation they're working on just to try to defeat it. And we have, we have one other um, bill that I didn't put up here. It's called the Animal Welfare Resolution. And it, it's a wonderful document. It just states all the wonderful, positive, uh, mainstream things that we all believe in. And then at the end, it instructs the legislature not to support um, basically things that are ideologically driven, um, different kinds of animal rights ideas. And that one, likewise, when we introduce that one, it ties people up for the entire session. They do nothing but fight that. And in the process, the lawmakers get educated because they're fighting against a bill that has one good thing in it after another. And they're fighting it simply because of this one line that's at the end. Um, we put out a congressional newsletter. It's at the back of the room there. Um, and then again, the NAIA Trust is the legislative branch of the group. Um, we have just added a new legislative online platform. I think most of you folks are familiar with something called um, CapWiz. Well, CapWiz has just expanded and upgraded their program, and we took advantage of it, and this is going to be our new legislative platform. Actually, it's up now. We just just completed it, and so you can go to NAIA Trust and then to the Lobby Center and you can find uh, this little place to go. And we put out, um, for the last year, year and a half, we've been working on almost nothing but infrastructure because we found we couldn't compete with, with the folks that we were fighting against. No matter how much knowledge we have, no matter how much skill, no matter how much professionalism we have, in our group, we simply didn't have the capacity to be able to deal with them. So for the last two and a half years, all we've really done is work on building our, all of our online communications, and in this case, our legislative platform. Um, we have been very, very effective working on legislation. I know that uh, years ago, when the horse slaughter bill first came up, is Karen Cowan in the room? 
by the way, there you are, I'm gonna have you stand up and say something here in a minute. But when that bill came up, we were told by the chairman of the House Ag Committee that we generated more letters than all of the other advocate groups combined and all of the other side. So we are able to uh, marshal really tremendous forces when it's needed. And I'm, I'm just giving you that little um, talk because we haven't done much legislation during the time that we have been building infrastructure, which has been, like I said, about two years. I mean, we have dealt with some major bills, but not like we used to, and we're gonna be back in that business very, very soon. That's really the end of my presentation. I just wanted to give a run through to you of what we're doing at NAIA, NAIA Trust, so that you would know what resources we had available for you. And so now we're all available for questions. So if you have a question, I'm ha gonna have you go ahead and stand up so that everyone can hear you. You wanna start? I guess my question, I want to start with a question, and that is why not use the NRA model as a, a way to deal with legislation issues? Here's the background to my question. A few years ago, in the state of uh, Pennsylvania, Rick Santorum, a leading Republican senator, sponsored a bill that no one in the room probably was happy with. And the citizens of that state obviously didn't like that because they took them out of office which is the NRA model, you know, go after their political life. And what I'm wondering, I, I love your presentations, by the way, and your strategy and some of the things you said. I'm just wondering why that isn't part of the logic used by the, the group who fight that kind of thing. You want to take that? Who wants to take that? You can. <coughs> Is there a right or wrong answer? I, I can't give it. You know, I would say yes, if we have the resources to be that aggressive, if we have the coalitions to work together to be that aggressive, absolutely. Of course we could do that. No, that's not where I'm going. Okay. Where, where I'm going is if, if the person who introduces the legislation has to think about the fact he may not be there the next time, then he might think about you know who's involved and he may not get as many co-sponsors as they did the last time but it seems like the, the the model seems to be in some way take the legislation down whether you defeat it or whether you go through the committees or whatever route you do but the guy who proposes it lives to come back another day i'm just wondering where is the logic in that well, I think probably the folks speaking up here are speaking on behalf of their organizations, and, and I think probably everybody agrees with you that we would like to take out these people, but we all collaborate with others, and there are some people, and I want to, Brian, Brian, uh, protect the harvest, Brian Clippenstein, and I think that there are groups that we with who, who would adopt that model that we can work with, but most of the people up here, I can't speak for the ADMA, having been on the AKC board for 16 years, one of the great problems we have is we have delegate bodies that don't all agree with one another, and so taking really aggressive stances sometimes is, uh, is winds up dividing your own group. Uh, nonetheless, I think all of the different people in leadership roles can work with others, like Protect the Harvest or some of the other groups that can take this, this uh, action. I will say that when the mandatory spay and neuter bill was introduced in Florida, that was the first bill that was introduced that was so egregious that everyone that bred or had animals pulled together. And that was the first time we saw people putting out just handwritten petitions at dog shows, at county fairs, within just weeks we had thousands of signatures. And that legislator had no idea what he was getting into. You know, we always say they come to Tallahassee and their heads are empty. If they're an attorney, they know about being an attorney. If they're a doctor, they know about being a doctor. Well, um, the animal rights people had gotten to this gentleman and convinced him of what a wonderful bill this was and how everybody was going to support it. He had no clue. We ended up having to pull the bill, hold the press conference, but only because it was such an awful bill that everyone could agree with it and everyone mobilized. We didn't even have to mobilize and the word got out and there were petitions all over the place and he had press conferences and apologized and just totally backed off. 
but it takes it's very hard sometimes to get that you know when you're you're talking about your your right to bear arms that is a very specific issue that you can all agree on but sometimes on these animal bills that come into the legislature you'll have the um the veterinarians sort of see it one way uh, we have a community cat issue in florida and even among the veterinarians the fbma there's big dissension so that does make it a little bit more difficult. If you have something that's so awful that everyone pulls together, you can have that kind of power. And if you tell someone we're going to take your gun, that's one issue that you can agree on. So I think that makes it a little bit more difficult. But I love the strategy. We would love to have it. It's our power. Uh, most groups just don't. You know, it's a, it's a question of resources. We're, we're trying to get uh, to get to the level of one million dollars for our pack. You know, to become a million dollar pack. That will be a tremendous achievement for the NMA. It is small potatoes in Washington. You can get to that. So the NRA is such a an unusual. It's an outlier where they can actually move you know millions of people uh, for political action. Oh, the strategy is great. It's just very, very few organizations uh, have that capability. And, and Dr. Battaglia, you, you bring up Senator Santorum and excellent what happened with him. Just keep in mind that strategy is also available to us because the principal sponsor of 1634, Lloyd Levine, is no longer in the California legislature because of 1634. And I'll have to, uh, to, uh, to him. Martin, can I? Uh, just like to add to that, um, some of the uh, dog people, mostly the, the sporting people in Pennsylvania, have announced that they are opposing Representative Gerlich's uh, re-election, and they've asked uh, the Federation to work with them on that. And I think the issue is really, you know, what level of government are you talking about? Because you don't have to influence you know, tens of millions of people in order to get rid of a local representative. You, you know, you can target that. You need to know which groups in your area are going to be effective in targeting that person. Um, I would like to follow up on just one other thing because the, uh, the Shelter Reporting Act is a terrific model for people to look at. Having it in one state is great. You can use that state as leverage to say, look at what wonderful things Barn is doing. Why aren't we doing this terrific thing in our state? And I was talking to Barb yesterday, and Barb said to me, she's getting calls from shelters in Florida sending her their information and asking her if there's any other information she wants because they've got it they just haven't been reporting it and they're perfectly willing to let let her have it and if we can get other states to implement this one of the purposes of this bit was to be able to track i'm in florida i send dogs up to massachusetts i report on my outcomes before this bill that i had um a a live uh, rate of, of, you know, of leaving the, the shelter of 90%, but, you know, maybe 60% of that was dogs that I shipped to another shelter someplace, and there was no way to track it. If we can get these bills in other states, they will have to report what's coming in, where it's coming from, and where, where they're sending their dogs when they have too many to deal with. We really need to this around the country. Okay, we're going to take one more question and then we've got to move on to the next. I know there's a lot of passion in the room for this. Why don't you go ahead? My question is mostly for Adrian. You spoke about taking advantage of local state federations. Um, and I think that the dreaded state of California, <laughs> <laughs> um, where the California Veterinary Medical Association was in favor of Assembly Bill 1630. What do you do in situations like that? You pay. Also, you really should not only speak with law schools, but to veterinary schools. Because those are really <laughs> Again, how do you address things when the state generation is not very positive, shall we say? Well, yeah, thank you for your question. And that's, that's a difficult, um, you know, set of circumstances. Uh, first of all, we, we do speak to veterinary schools. We actually have. Uh, an officer on the executive board uh, who does nothing but liaison to veterinary schools. And we have a staff person who does that. So I just at Ohio State did, did a, a talk. But you're right. Um, that's a whole other <laughs> issue. The changing 
political uh, reality, you know, with veterinary medicine. But in, in that situation, it's an unusual case, you know, and it, there will be issues perhaps that NAA and the state DMA will not agree on. Uh, hopefully it's not going to be, you know, an everyday occurrence. But in that situation, I think it just it comes down to having veterinarians who agree with your point of view be active. You know, within that DMA, it's the same thing as influencing legislators. You, you know, whoever shows up is going to have influence. And sometimes small numbers, as with you know, DMA, like in California, is a strange example. It's so big. You know, um, in, in some state DMAs, you know, two, three, four veterinarians who are involved, who are on a legislative committee, who do grassroots work, um, have a lot of influence. You know, on what happens. So I would say, you know, cultivate the veterinarians that they work with and who agree with you to be active in the CBMA. You know, again, CBMA like ABMA, it's, you know, whoever's in the leadership, they have, you know, they, they vote on things. It's going to reflect their perspectives. I just wanted to speak to the um, importation issue. When we got involved three years ago trying to pass this bill um, on reporting, I had not a clue what was going on in my state. And I will tell you that many animal rights people who work in shelters um, in humane rescues did not have a clue of what was going on in Florida. When we were writing this bill, we were in a meeting with all the parties, HSUS, PA, PETA, veterinarians, legislative aides, um, FAKC, we were all sitting in a meeting and we were talking to an animal um, control officers. And we were all talking about a category of um, transfers and someone from HSUS said, let me ask a question about the de definition of transfer. Are we talking from one humane or one shelter within Florida, or are we talking about trucks that are coming, say, from um, Gulfport, Mississippi? Dead silence in the room. We're like, what? Well, since the bill passed, we've been doing a lot of research, and we got the Department of Agriculture involved. And just coming down I-10, through one inspection station, we found a website for a transport company that posts all over their website. Um, 78 souls just left Gulfport, Mississippi for Tampa Bay Humane Rescue. Um, April 17, 100 souls just left, puppies and, and um, adult puppies. Um, we got the Commissioner of Agriculture's Department of Inspection involved, and they said, this isn't happening. And, and we gave them the website. I've got 32 pages of Facebook posts saying 32 dogs, 150 dogs. Um, they came from Texas, then they went to Gulfport, and then they came into Tampa Bay. Just in July, we have a public, have a public records request. Just in the month of July, from this one little Florida, Florida they had uh, four stops with 80 to 100 dogs, and I've been reading every health certificate. The first couple were turned around because they didn't have health certificates. Then they all had health certificates signed by the same person. But then we started reading the health certificate, and 30 to 40 of the animals that came in were four weeks old, which is the law in Florida requires they be at least eight weeks old. This reporting bill has shed such a light on what is happening, and apparently they were quarantined and still released to these rescues in the Tampa Bay, Sarasota area, and now we've got to find out what happened. But that was just in the month of July coming through this one station where they were stopped, they were allowed to go on, the animals were placed under quarantine, but allowed to go through, and we don't know exactly what's happened. That's the next step. That's only the month of July's records for one station. Are you tracking back enough to be able to see who's breeding them? No. Because don't, aren't we all kind of believing now shelters are getting in the breeding business? I don't know what this means, but I'm just telling you that we are discovering things that we had no clue were going on in our state. And it's a real eye over to some of the legislators, I think to the, the um, Department of Agriculture and to the state veterinarian, because none of, no one believed this was truly happening including our commissioner of agriculture who said to marion ammer of nra it doesn't exist until we gave she gave him pictures of the problem i'd like tim golden to be recognized because tim single-handedly is the person who now has a pipeline to the department of agriculture state of florida who sent him oh you have another this, report these are the records that you were talking about for animals who were transferred into the state of Florida just in August. 
Make one plug here. Today, as I am here, my staff is running a breeders seminar for me at my office for about 100 breeders. Uh, what we're trying to establish along with that is an adopt a vet student program. This is something that all of you can think about going back and talking to your veterinary schools, the, the states that you have them in, whether you breed birds or cats or dogs or pigs, it doesn't matter. But start thinking about how you can, on a grassroots level with the veterinary students, get to them because they're already getting the other side's message much more clearly than we're sending ours. So go back, look it up, figure out how to do it. I'm speaking to our vet school um, students through the AKC outreach program on November 13th, or I'm sorry, November 21st, but nevertheless, um, you all have that opportunity to do this grassroots with law students, with vet students, get them while we still can have some influence in their, their future careers.